I found the undock and the fly around on both flights, SGS 111 and 113, to be a pretty emotional time, especially for the station crews, because it's the first time after they've lived there for five or six months to back away and look at the station and see how large it's grown. It's really a beautiful time to look at the station with the earth in the background. We have a go for main engine start. Mission and liftoff of the Scuff Star, celebrating its 25th birthday by racking up science and supplies to the space station. The uh, solid rocket boosters uh, are all away. Columbia Houston, UHF Conch. How do you go about building the most impressive megastructure ever built? How do you build a gigantic modular laboratory and living habitat that streaks over our head at 7 kilometers a second, some 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth? The answer is, in many, many stages. Contrary to the beliefs of sillier people, the ISS wasn't exactly built in space. It was built on the ground, in many pieces, that were then launched into space and assembled in orbit. Construction began, as stated in the previous video, with the launch of the Zarya module by a Russian proton rocket in 1998. Technically, the station isn't finished, even today, as it's supposed to remain in operation for at least another 10 years. Today, we're going to go over the first portion of its construction, ending with STS-113 in 2002. Node 1, named Unity, was the first piece of hardware to be delivered to the Zarya module by Shuttle Endeavour in December of 1998. Unity had six berthing locations for attachment of other modules, and a pressurized mating adapter for shuttle dockings. Endeavour performed a rendezvous with Zarya, and grabbed it using the shuttle's famous Canadarm robotic arm, and then used the shuttle's RCS thrusters to move the two modules together. Again, uh, we were operating almost at the limit of the robotic arm because the uh, Unity module extended about 40 feet out of the payload bay, and so the arm was almost fully extended as we brought Zarya up and over Unity into the install position. We actually couldn't see the mating surface where it was going to mate, so we had to use cameras alone. This is the elbow camera view. And again, we fired the thrusters to attain that capture sequence with the uh, androgynous uh, positioning mechanism. Just a really nice view of the space station docked to uh, Endeavour out the overhead window. And uh, now it's time to go to work and start the spacewalks. One seven-hour spacewalk later, 40 different connectors and cables held the two modules together, and the Unity node was activated. Several more days would be spent installing various utilities inside and outside the station, as well as stowing equipment within the Unity module for the next flight. Despite all of this work, the station wasn't quite operational yet. This would be achieved with another Russian Proton rocket that would take the Svezda module to the station providing it with all of its life support systems, as well as crew capacity for two people. Fun fact, Pizza Hut reportedly paid around one million US dollars to have their logo emblazoned on the side of the rocket. With the station still devoid of crew, STS-92 launched the Discovery on the shuttle program's 100th mission in 2000. This mission installed the Z-1 truss, the first piece of exterior framework for the station that would provide it with rigidity when reorienting itself. Here's a picture of us getting our tools um, over at the, one of the toolboxes that we eventually installed onto Z1. And uh, you can see in space, you can orient yourself any way that uh, that'll work to, to uh, get what you need done. Here's a picture of Bill getting the arm set up. He's putting a foot restraint onto the arm. He's attaching that, and then he's going to stand in it and uh, lock his boots in. And uh, he and I switch places on EVAs 1 and 3, uh, getting driven around on the arm. And uh, here's a picture of Bill working on the... Uh, working on the, um, some cables there. This is the um, SASA antenna that we relocated. Um, Bill's got it in his hands there. He's attached to the robot arm, and I'm assisting him there in a foot restraint. We temp stowed that, and that'll get put on by uh, the next flight to launch in just a few days. This was the part that we were most worried about on AVA-1. This was the uh, KU band antenna that we launched up on Z-1. Bill had to grab that and uh, manually pull it out on the arm, and then uh, I helped him attach it, and then uh, we were able to deploy it, 
and swing it out of the way to make room for the P6 that's going up on the next flight. This was really a spectacular uh, sight in space, watching this big structure uh, swinging out, and uh, hopefully this will this will make the IMAX movie, and you'll be able to see it in a couple of years. The next mission would temporarily attach one of the huge U.S. solar arrays to this truss during STS-97. So this is a view out of our uh, night uh, camera, the, the B camera. Uh, it was supposed to swing out on its own on a spring, but. Uh, Things don't always work as expected, and I had to do a lot of pushing, as did Joe on his uh, mast when it uh, swung out. Once it was completely out, I crawled out onto the end of the mast uh, tip fitting and swung out the blanket boxes. Uh, each box weighed about 800 pounds, but it was just fingertip pressure to make it uh, go all the way out. At that point, I'm about 100 feet from the bottom of the payload bay of the orbiter. Well, with uh, Joe and Carlos complete with their task and the ground complete with its activation task, it was time to deploy the first array. Uh, we actually commanded that uh, sequence to start from on board the, the shuttle on the aft flight deck. And you can see uh, th the mast come out of the canister, and it's amazing that over 100 feet of mast is uh, folded up into that canister, as well as the uh, solar array blankets. We had a great view from outside, and the still pictures that we took are absolutely fantastic. Some of the panels uh, stuck together, and they would eventually release themselves, but uh, as they did, you, you could see the dynamics in the array. They got more and more dynamic uh, to the point where, where finally, the, uh, at this release here on the left box in your picture, the uh, subsequent crashing down, if you will, will was enough to uh, cause uh, both tension lines on both tension reels, and here it is right there, to come off of the tension reel. You can see the resultant uh, motion in the blanket box, or the blankets. This mission also added to the truss structure, and prepared a docking port for another module that would come on the next flight. Atlantis, launched in 2001, delivered the Destiny Laboratory module to the station, NASA's first permanent research station since Skylab. I'm pulling the lab out of the bay here, it's uh, the hard part is done, um, and I've picked the rate up, you can see. We've it took about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes to flip the lab, and we can't show you that, so we're going to go through it a little bit faster here. They put the lab in 180 degrees out, and I've been doing nothing but trying to explain why, and, you know, pick a reason. I don't know. <laughs> here it is at 90 degrees, just about 90 degrees, and the best view was what Tom and Beamer had outside. So here's the lab 90 degrees to the payload bay being shot from up on the truss. Continue to flip it around. It just was amazing, and uh, so the, the tourists are always taking pictures of everything. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost all the way around, and there it is, all the way around and getting ready to be put onto the node. And it just slid in there as happy as could be. There it is, all attached. Yay is right. <laughs> <laughs> It also has a really nice window from which to view the Earth. STS-102 shuttle Discovery delivered ESP-1 to the station. This is the external stowage platform which holds spare parts for the station that don't need to be kept in a pressurized environment. Currently, there are three such platforms on the station. STS-100 would launch in May of 2001, and I believe 100 was not a mission number but a measure of awesomeness. Not only did this mission have Canadian treasure Chris Hadfield aboard, but it also featured the installation and activation of the Canadarm 2. Well, uh, as was mentioned earlier, this was the most complex robotics flight in the history of the shuttle program, and it began the day after uh, docking with uh, the first of several uh, difficult maneuvers. Uh, seen here is the uh, shuttle robotic arm, which is like a big crane, 
and I'm operating it, and I've uh, grappled and lifted the cradle containing the space station arm uh, out of the payload bay. Uh, as I lifted it out, it was just a magnificent sight passing over Baja, California. I twisted it and brought it forward, uh, overhead the shuttle cockpit into a position where we could temporarily install it on the International Space Station. And then it was time to bring the arm to life. I'm remo removing a bunch of blankets that kept it warm uh, while it was unpowered. And uh, then if you look in the lower right, Scott's driving a huge power drill uh, called a pistol grip tool. I'm riding on the other arm. And the purpose is to release the huge bolts that held the arm during launch. We call them super bolts. They are about three feet long. They look sort of like arrows. And uh, so we put them over in that thing below my chest over there called the quiver, putting the super bolts away one by one. Well, if you've ever dreamt about what it would be like to do a spacewalk, this is it. This is actually what I saw at the end of the uh, space lab pallet as it was about to lift up the, the booms of the space station robotic arm. It, was, uh, it took a uh, considerable amount of force. Here's a different view of it. I'm on the left, and Chris is free-floating on the right. It weighs about 140 pounds of force uh, required to pop that up, and you can see it's a massive structure. It's 60 feet from end effector to end effector on the arm and weighs about 3,000 pounds. You're going to see Chris uh, back on the robotic arm, the shuttle's arm, with uh, Jeff driving it, and we're going to unfurl the arm at uh, uh, the midway point, and you can see it's just a, a huge uh, structure. This robotic arm is key to the station, as it not only provided a useful tool for construction, but also serves a purpose in maintenance, supporting astronauts on EVA, and grappling unmanned vehicles during rendezvous and capture. STS-104 delivered the Quest joint airlock to the station, designed to host spacewalks for both American and Russian spacesuits. Prior to this, the Russians could only depart from the Zvezda module, and the Americans could only depart when a space shuttle was docked. The next piece would be delivered by the Russians aboard a Soyuz rocket, delivering another docking compartment designed for the Soyuz and Progress spacecrafts. Next, the Americans returned with STS-110, and installed another addition to the station's truss system. Endeavour would add a mobile base system on the next flight, which allows the robotic arms of the station to move along rails installed on the station's truss system. The next two flights would further expand this truss system, readying the ISS for the installation and relocation of its iconic gigantic solar arrays. However, this wouldn't come for some time, as STS-113 would be the final successful shuttle flight for nearly three years. Again, We'll leave this to the next video, with this incomplete space station orbiting the Earth in 2002. If you like this video, please give it a like. If you want to see more, please subscribe to my channel, which is Dead Kennedy in Space. If you want to support me further, consider donating on Patreon, or purchasing some of my work through Amazon or Teespring. Thank you, and I'll see you over the curve, Space Cowboys. Live there, on the moat of dust, suspended in a sunbeam, in a vast cosmic arena.